High up in the frozen Arctic, 800 miles north at the tip of Norway, lies a special cluster of islands called Svalbard. For a polar scientist like Professor Andy Hodson, it's a huge natural laboratory with an incredible and unique concentration of resources. For me, coming to Svalbard is just fantastic on account of all the diversity of this landscape here. I can't name many rock types that aren't present. I can't think of any type of glacier or ice cap that we don't find here. So the landscape has the diversity to it that really attracts scientists like myself. The landscape here is totally frozen. We call this continuous permafrost. The only bit that thaws in the summer is a seasonal thaw layer, the, what we call the active layer, that forms to about one to two meters thick every summer. And one of the widely held views is that with all the frozen ground here, when it thaws, it begins to release some very dangerous, potent greenhouse gases, and one of them is methane. Current thinking suggests this cocktail of gases causes a greenhouse effect, locking us into an ever-increasing cycle of faster thawing and releasing more and more greenhouse gases. But what if we're oversimplifying the problem? We assume that whenever permafrost thaws and produces wetlands, we have methane production. So we need to explore these environments to see indeed whether methane is being produced. And when we do this in Svalbard, we actually find that there's not that much methane at all in such wetlands. Andy has spent years carrying out painstaking research in some of the harshest conditions on the planet. What he's discovering suggests our current thinking about methane in the polar regions may need a reboot. It's a hostile environment for science here. We have roughly the same number of polar bears here as there are people, and polar bear encounters are getting more and more common with this kind of field work. It can be minus 30. We need to visit as many of these sampling sites as possible, and we're using snow scooters, and there's a wind chill associated with that, so things can get very cold, and everything has to be considered. We're a long way from anywhere, really. And then doing your hard-won science at the end of it. And sometimes a lot more of the focus is, is on working safely. You have to remember every few minutes, have a good look around, look over your shoulder, and then focus back on your work. You can uh, usually just mark it with your boot. If you've got a rubber boot and you're drilling, you just put your sole on it for a moment. Andy has been working in this frozen wilderness for 25 years. But it was only recently that he and his students started looking for methane. All the data suggested they should be detecting large quantities of methane during the summer thaw. But his results pointed to something different. We started sampling various wetlands on each side of the fjord here. Whenever we collected samples, we never really found much methane. All we ever found when we looked in the samples that we collected was iron. There was iron everywhere. So why iron and not methane? Could this base metal be playing a part in suppressing the methane they were expecting? After scouring numerous publications, Andy found his answer in a little-known scientific formula called the redox scale. The redox scale helps us understand how greedier microorganisms can exploit certain elements for energy, like iron. Push, push, push. Yeah. Like a newborn baby. Oh, don't say that. <laughs> and then lower down the redox scale, we have methanogens, microbes that produce the methane. And so we then start to consider maybe it's this community of microorganisms dominating this environment and stopping the methanogens from being successful. All living organisms need iron, 
Sir Andy worked out that this large concentration of dissolved iron seeping into the sea acts as a huge fertiliser for life. The coastal waters became a rich soup of plankton, feeding off this powerful source of energy. And there's a knock-on effect for climate change models. The iron being washed into the sea is able to promote biological activity in the oceans, where we have very high rates of photosynthesis by plankton in the water. And we end up with a kind of balancing effect then. We can offset some of the carbon dioxide and methane release with a plankton bloom fertilised by the waters that are released from the permafrost and flowing into the sea. It's positive news. A large-scale iron-pumping carbon sink sucking some of that carbon out of the atmosphere. It's not included in the current climate model predictions, so it's a welcome angle for climatologists. But the wider view had yet another surprise for Andy's team. Part of this trying to get the big picture of this whole landscape and how it's changing and releasing methane and other greenhouse gases has led us to discover that there's a new source of new methane and that this counteracts any effect of fertilisation that might be occurring in coastal waters. This chance discovery came about when Andy turned his attention to a series of enigmatic and unique polar features called pingos. It was within these small ice blisters that he found clues which would lead him to question current climate change models. Pingos are small hills that form when freezing of groundwater occurs beneath and heaves up the ground surface. And we found for the first time that some of these pingos can be absolutely full of methane. So we found a new methane source direct to the atmosphere that we didn't think anyone had really found before. Good. To prove this, his next challenge was to bring the laboratory out into the harsh conditions of the field. The chemical clues they were looking for were fragile and would quickly become invalid. If we take a sample from the site and then put it somewhere warm and take it back to the laboratory, you get information that's changed, so you don't have the information that tells you about the water as it's emerging from the pingo. You have information that tells you about the effects of warming and time upon the sample that you've taken. The solution was a portable and tough mini laboratory, specially designed by Sheffield University to test samples out in the wilderness before they had chance to degrade. This equipment that we developed was unique really. We had to develop a special means of doing water chemistry at temperatures above freezing so electrodes wouldn't freeze and break in the cold temperatures. I've got a heater here which will kick in if the unit inside goes below 10 degrees. And it'll do that when I start to push this water through and then it'll flood a cell where the electrodes are sitting and those electrodes give us the chemistries that would change if we took a sample and took it back to the lab. By looking very carefully at the chemistry of the water that's coming out the pingos under quite difficult conditions, we've been able to find methane for the first time using very sensitive measurements on the site at temperatures up down to minus 30 and really get a good understanding of the chemical processes in the water that's coming out of these pingos. These tiny windows reveal a vast and unknown world beneath, a black box of clues to be unpicked by forensic science. At the moment, we don't know, but we're starting to realise how old the water might be. We've established that the methane within the water is more like natural gas that we burn at home when we're cooking, rather than the, the young methane that's produced in the active layer and in, in, on the surface of the permafrost. So we really are gaining really nice insights through these little windows. There are lots of other parts of the Arctic with similar bedrock, 
similar permafrost environments and, and also pingos. So we think we might be seeing things here that, are, that occur in East Greenland uh, and Alaska and of course Siberia. What we're doing here is trying to bring the physical and chemical and biological understanding of methane production together with the modelling community. So people who are building the models and running them and so the outcome hopefully in the future will be a, a better model with better predictions of methane release from wetlands.